Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and other subject matter experts who explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. To our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. As a reminder, if you like what you're hearing today, do us a favor and follow our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so that we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. This past week, one of America's most top secret defense programs dominated headlines, the B-21 Raider. And for good reason. We knew the program existed for the past six years, but that was really about it. Everything else, aside from a handful of artist renderings and some generalized assertions regarding macro capabilities, was all we knew. The curtain was literally pulled open this past Friday, with the first aircraft rolled out in front of a select group of government leaders, defense figures, and the press. And members of the Mitchell team were there, witnessing a milestone in air power history firsthand. So we've got them here today so you can learn what it was like to be there and get a better understanding regarding where the program is right now and where it needs to go. So with that, we've got Lieutenant General David Deptula. Hey, thanks. Good to be here. We also have Mark Gunzinger. Hi, Slick. Great to join you again. And last but not least, Doug Berkey. Hey, man. Great to be here. All right. So, Doug, let's let's kick this off with you. So, just in general, what was it like to attend the event? I got to be honest with you, Slick. This was incredibly impactful. This wasn't just seeing an aircraft. This mission set and this drive for realizing this capability goes back to the core of air power. And so this is much about realizing the next step in that legacy as just going to see a new airplane. And when you see something like that, it isn't just looking at an airplane. It's looking at all of the people that were part of making it happen. And so you heard about that a few episodes ago when we had members of our team, like General Deptula and Gonzo and General Tilton and and General Lyon, talk about their experiences. But the team is so much bigger. So I very much had that in mind because these things just don't manifest on their own. But from a nuts and bolts perspective, Northrop Grumman and the Air Force knock it out of the park big time. It it was a huge home run. So we had a set of briefings with their leadership on the front end. And then there was a open display of aircraft that related to the Northrop Grumman product line. You had B-2, Hawkeye, F-35, X-47, Triton. They had a B-25, obviously, with the Raider legacy. And to actually be able to look at those aircraft, to be able to see the evolution in history was really, really something. And and frankly, it's rare to be able to stare at a B-2 and really take it in, all the technology. We talk about it all the time. We think about it. But to really just look at it was impressive. Then when the sun was going down, we were signaled to go to the event area. And this is all in the hangars they use for, for B-2 depot work. So we go over there, you had to check in your phone. They had government dignitaries on the right. They had think tank folks and other DVs in the center. And then I press us on the left. We had a singing a national anthem with a flyover of a B-52, a B-1 and burner and a B-2. And I got to say, every national anthem should be conducted that way. It was fantastic. I I do think I saw Gonzo jumping up and down a little bit with that B-52 going overhead. (laughs) Oh, I was. (laughs) In the... Then you had Kathy Warden, who's the head of Northrop Grumman, give remarks, and she really set the stage well. And she then gave the signal for the hangar doors to open up, and there it was. And it was really cool because they had it covered in this white sheet. And if you remember the advertising campaign, it was a white sheet over, I think it was the X-47. It carried that continuity, and it was bathed in blue light. There were white lights out at us, so it was almost like a dreamlike stake. You're seeing this thing. And then they pull it out. And obviously they pull the sheet and everything. And there you are. And it's amazing because this is something we've thought about. We've talked about. I remember exactly where I was when they made the award announcement. I was in New York City with General Deptula. We were, we were doing a set of meetings with individuals up there. And, and I remember that happening and all the work we've done on this thing. And everybody's done it. And there it is. And so that is, is really quite amazing. We then had the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff give remarks and then Secretary of Defense. And Kathy Warden wrapped it. Obviously, it was a very significant event for anybody that attended. I don't think any of us at this table are going to forget it. 
Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. I wanted to clarify when you said every national anthem should be with airplanes and burner. I just want to clarify that. That's fantastic. Not, and not, I'm open to bombers, fighters, right? too. I'm <laughs> open to fighters, too. Yeah, yeah, that it had to be awesome. And uh, General Deptula and Gonzo, what were your impressions? Well, like Doug said, it was a, a, a very well done event, in my humble opinion. It was surprising with the unanticipated flybys, the B-52, B-1, and B-2. It was impressive, occurring at night, illuminated with blue light and artificial fog and anticipatory music as the hangar doors opened and revealed the drape-covered silhouette of the B-21 that was finally uncovered and rolled partially out of the hangar. And it was inspiring, with excellent remarks from the vice chairman and the secretary of defense were outstanding. As an unveiling, it was very cool, uh, and I give the producers of the event an A+. I'll throw in it. I agree. It's extremely well staged. To see the uh, past, the present, and the future of air power was just fantastic. But I'll, I'll throw one other thing there. I was thrilled to see the people who actually designed and built America's Next Bomber attend the ceremony. And they received two standing ovations, thanking them for their hard work, and they they really deserved it, and they really appreciate it. And it was also a nice touch to honor the families of the Doolittle Raiders, and flying in a, a B-52 as a, or B-25 was a great idea. See, there he goes. Always back to the B-52, yeah, every man, answer. So we have to live with there. <laughs> hey, they're uh, both on. Uh, that's no, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, I, I want to ask you this. How far away from you, the airplane to where you guys were? I mean, was it was it like far away to where you couldn't really see it, or did you feel like you could kind of reach out and touch it? No, nah, it was close. I got to be honest with you, the optics, because of the lighting, it was distorted. I mean, guys, I don't know, what were we, 100 feet away from it or something like yeah. that? But it, it really made it difficult to dial in on it because of this lighting. It's, it's hard to describe. Gonzo and General Deptula were in the front row. I, I was in the second row. You can't get better than that. And, and dead center. It's, there it is. Wow, that's awesome. All right, well, I want to move on a little bit. General Deptula and Gonzo, you've been working towards this event for the last three decades in one way or, or another. And we heard about that two episodes ago when we discussed the history leading up to the B-21. And you both were on various studies and were involved in helping evaluate requirements and a whole lot more, of course. We know canceling the B-2 at 21 aircraft was a huge mistake. So what does it mean to you personally to see the bomber production resume? Yeah, I'll start. Let me give you my perspective as a, a former B-52 combat crew member and mission commander. Now, when I first joined crew in the Strategic Air Command, our primary mission was to deter nuclear attacks on the U.S. by remaining prepared to penetrate Soviet airspace and conduct nuclear strikes on appropriate military targets such as ICBM fields. Now, our training missions typically included one or two aerial refuelings, high and low altitude navigation legs and practice bomb runs on targets that are located in simulated contested airspace and uh, oh they lasted for about 13 hours or even longer can't forget that so i said high altitude flight but low altitude flight was the most interesting part of a, a typical training sort because we flew military training routes for hours at a time usually somewhere between 400 and 800 feet above the ground that's because the B-52, which was originally designed to be a high altitude penetrating bomber, is not stealthy. And its crews had to adapt to increasingly capable Soviet air defenses by learning how to fly under the radar coverage and using train features to avoid detection in order to do their mission. So several years after I certified on my first nuclear mission, the B-1 began to join the force, which is specifically designed to flow low and fast to evade defenses. And here's my point. Throughout the Cold War, the Air Force periodically fielded new bombers with improved technologies that gave them the ability to penetrate enemy defenses and strike any target in the world. The honor roll includes the B-36, B-47, B-52, B-50A, B-1B, and Finally, the stealthy B-2. And that's where DoD broke the cycle of modernizing its bomber force. B-2 bios capped at 21 aircraft after the Cold War, which was just 16% of the Air Force's original requirement. And that modernization pause lasted for the next 25 years. Problem is, while we pause, our adversaries didn't. Russia and China both continued to mature their air defense technologies as we slept at the wheel. So 
The end result is a U.S. bomber force that's on the ramp today that lacks the survivability and assorting capacity needed for high-end great power conflict. So, back to the crew dock's perspective, the B-21 is real evidence that our country is once again serious about long-range penetrating strike, which is the foundation of how we project military power globally. And our bomber crews will finally have the tools they need to accomplish what our country asks them to do, which is prepare to strike any target in any threat environment anywhere in the world to recover, regenerate, and do it again until we win. Hey, Gonzo, I just want to add one thing from a crew's perspective. And again, I'm the, the non-operator here sitting at the table. But I see this airplane is once again sealing the deal from a moral perspective with air crews. We're actually giving them the chance to execute their mission and come home safe. We've stretched that way too thin across the Air Force fleet, given how old everything is and, and the tech just doesn't match to the threat. And this aircraft, like you said, is, is really regaining that trust to the crews and saying, we're behind you. You're absolutely correct. A survivor of an airplane that can fight a war, not an engagement or two, that will be able to return, regenerate, fly, as I said, until we win. And, and that is a huge deal to our combat crew members. So, Slick, you asked what does it mean personally to see the bomber production resume. I'd tell you, to me, it means a lot. At the rollout, I sat on the front row next to Dr. Chris Bowie. Chris and I worked together in the Secretary of the Air Force Don Rice's policy group in 1989 and 90, 33 years ago. And we both contributed to the original document, The Case for the B-2. Later in 94-95, I was the Air Force rep on the Commission on Roles and Missions of the Armed Forces, and I was responsible for the future bomber force study that addressed the question, should the U.S. terminate bomber production or continue building long-range stealth bombers? And in it, I showed how enormously more valuable and cost-effective in delivering ordnance on targets at range that bombers are than any other alternative. I worked really hard to create the logic to reverse President Bush's decision to cut the B-2 to 20 and instead build 75 B-2s. But the Pentagon leadership was happy to use the money freed up by that termination on other priorities. So sitting at the B-21 rollout is kind of a, hopefully, a story that... <laughs> hit home with the audience, I thought about one night that I met with Chris and Fred Frostick, who at the time was a retired Air Force colonel working in the OSD staff. We all went to dinner at the Carlisle Grand to exchange notes about what was going on with the Pentagon's approach to the B-2 reduction and what I was doing in my study to try to reverse that. Well, it turns out that then recently retired General Larry Welch former chief and commander of Strategic Air Command, was also dining there. And he, he, he caught a look at us, and he stopped by our table, and he leaned over, and he said, looks like you three are the only ones left in the Pentagon who want to build more B-2s. I guess what I'd tell you today and what struck me sitting there watching the B-21 rollout is let's not make the same mistake again by underbuilding the B-21. We need sufficient numbers because of the options they'll provide to future presidents, combat commanders, and the nation. Now, yesterday I was in an exchange with a Marine zealot who was questioning the cost of the B-21 and positing that its mission could be accomplished by buying more cruise missiles. But this is a typical response to people who have never been involved in major theater war, and all they've seen are counterinsurgencies that involve a handful of strikes a day. And here's what he asked. He said, what's unique about manned bombers versus long-range precision fires? My response, speed, responsiveness, range, flexibility, independence of basing, reusability, persistence, lethality, precision, conventional and nuclear deterrent effects, survivability. These are just some of the characteristics that make bombers unique versus long-range precision fires. And I'd remind the audience that depending on the scenario, a conflict involving China or Russia, for that matter, could involve over 100,000 aim points. Desert Storm was 40 to 45,000. To acquire the number of cruise missiles with only a fraction of the attributes I just mentioned 
would be cost prohibitive and unidimensional relative to the application across a range of military demands and scenarios that bombers provide. Heck, I'd add, you know, look at Ukraine right now. We're running out there. And and that's a the entire Western supply flowing in. Yeah. Just with that respect, a, a, a statistic hits me. The Ukrainians are expending 20,000 artillery rounds a day. The administration came out the other day and said they were very proud that they could turn out and supply them with 20,000 rounds a month. Yeah. Just doesn't add. Yeah. Yeah, great points, General Deptil. I appreciate you. You know, really just breaking that down. That that Marine Corps example is is terrific. Doug, I want to ask you this because you said there was a B two there at the event, and you know the opportunity to look at that jet, which is you know super rare to see up close, and then to see the B twenty one is you know truly incredible. So, what were your thoughts? You know, just sitting there looking at the two airplanes. Okay, first off, I remember when that B two was was rolled out and unveiled. I was a kid, and it was so impactful. And I got to say, this many decades later, it is still impactful. You look at that, and every inch of it is calculated for an effect. And knowing what computer technology was back then, it's just mind-blowing how good they were. Now, when you look at B-21, there are a few takeaways. First off, I, you know, again, we're just staring at it from, like I said, 100 feet away or whatever. But the yellow did appear to be far more advanced, very, very clean. But really, you know, it's a flying wing. So that's what a lot of people said in the public. Well, what's the difference? You know, no, everything that's different about that jet is really on the inside. The sensors, the processing power, the EW, the connectivity, the ability to team, it is all in there and it is what's going to make that airplane. And it's going to be what gives the COCOM and other actors in the battle space phenomenal options that nobody else will be able to, to deliver. I mean, we, we talk about JADC too. And, and uh, you have to have an effector in the battle space for joint all domain command and control to matter. I put it this way, you know, Battle of Britain, we talk about radars and fighter planes. Well, if it had just been the radars, you wouldn't have netted an effect against the, the liftoff. You need something to close the deal. And the B-21 is going to be a huge element of that. But it's going to be able to draw that data real time, provide it to other actors in the battle space, deliver effects, you know, whether it be a kinetic with, with a bomb or, or a missile or, or non-kinetic. I mean, it, it is mind-blowing where this technology could go over time. And I think the modularity in the open architecture of it is going to allow it to get modernized progressively uh, throughout its tenure. And so what we looked at on Friday is not the jet that's going to be online, you know, in 10 years or in 20 years. It's going to keep evolving, and it's just really exciting to think where it could go. Yeah, that is incredible. How about you, uh, General Deptula and Gonzo? you want to hop in on that? Yeah. Beyond its lethality, the B-21 is going to be a highly flexible weapon system whose long-range, high payload, and sensor potential, as well as its high survivability, really renders it indispensable in a variety of roles across the conflict spectrum. It's a product of the information age, as Doug mentioned. The B-21 is going to be able to harness its sensors and processing power to understand the battle space in a real-time way, simply not possible with current bombers. And that includes the B-2. It'll also be able to partner with external sources providing and pulling as well as providing data. Northrop Grumman recently announced that it's also been designed as the lead component of a larger family of systems that will deliver intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, electronic attack, and multi-domain networking capabilities. So this thing's been designed to exploit information age developments and uh, concepts. I think the B-21, and I've been on this tune for 20 years now, but it needs perhaps to be better thought of as a long-range sensor shooter uh, because, you know, the bomber nomenclature tends to drag out very old preconceptions. And this especially applies when the B-21s integrated with other nodes in the future combat cloud that will permeate every domain. So this is the promise of the vision of joint all-domain warfare, and the B-21 is going to be the linchpin of that operating concept. Yeah, I'd like to uh, 
mentioned I was really impressed to learn that the Raider we saw Friday evening isn't a shell of an aircraft like the Potemkin models we've seen some of our adversaries roll out to impress gullible audiences. It's the real deal. A complete production representative aircraft. And as Northrop Grumman CEO said at the rollout, the next time you see Raider number one, it's going to be flying. That, that is really impressive, especially since contract was let in 2015. That's almost light speed today's acquisition process. So I'd also like to mention the word I heard most frequently during the rollout was deterrence. And I was really happy to hear that. Now, we've lived through the years of the pivot to the Pacific, then the second offset strategy, and today's catchphrase is the so-called integrated deterrence concept. But the rollout is hard evidence that DoD is finally putting its resources where its rhetoric is. So for me, the B-21 is all about improving our ability to deter China. It is our nation's China deterrence bomber. And I say that because no other capability in DoD or in the militaries of our allies and friends will provide the same mix of survivability, connectivity, long ranges, large weapons payloads that will be needed to blunt and then halt a uh, Chinese invasion of Taiwan or another area that China seeks to dominate by force. All right, General Deltula, I promise I'm not trying to spin you up here, but I have to be honest. <laughs> you know, I got pretty fired up because I thought it was so odd that the Air Force leadership did not speak at this event. We had the head of Northrop, uh, we had the Secretary of Defense, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, which all makes sense, but no airmen. And last time I checked, I don't recall seeing Air Force generals christening aircraft carriers or unveiling new tanks. So what's your thought on this? And if you were tasked to make remarks, what would you highlight? Well, Slick, the decision on who are the speakers was intentional and meant to reinforce the value of the B-21 for the entire Department of Defense and all the warfighting combatant commanders, not just one service. And the remarks by both the vice chairman and the secretary of defense were outstanding. That was all very appropriate. What was not appropriate was the absence of any Air Force leadership speaking at this momentous event. If General Curtis LeMay were alive today, he wouldn't have been sitting quietly in the audience. And I'll just leave it at that. There probably would have been a thrown cigar or two. No, no doubt about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, w- it would have been nice to see some Air Force leadership discussing that since airmen are going to be flying this thing. All right, Gonzo, what's next for the aircraft and the other six airframes Northrop Grumman leaders mentioned that are currently in production? Yeah. So what's next is testing to work out any remaining issues and ensure the B-21 meets requirements in representative operational conditions. Now, I already mentioned that I'm impressed that the rollout of B-21 number one occurred about seven years after Northrop Grumman received the contract, and that's pretty unheard of for uh, today's acquisition process. And rollout to operation of fielding should also be streamlined by testing requirements that will be likely less onerous than other programs that are more developmental in nature. And that's partly because the B-21 maximized the use of mature technologies and even major components where it made sense that they were designed for possibly other aircraft. And it also has an open architecture and a digital twin that will help engineers to rapidly evaluate issues that pop up during tests and then design fixes, and that will reduce the time and the cost to do so. So... I'll just say that we've all seen countless reports over the years. It seems like a new one pops out every two and a half years on the need for acquisition reform for DoD, the benefits of open architectures, digital twinning, and so on. But now we are seeing their benefits in real life, not just on paper. And that is just as impressive as its size, its shape, and its other attributes. Now, it's a huge point, Gonzo. I mean, if you think about it, this is the first aircraft to really come out since all those reforms are passed and since all these concepts are put on the table and people need to really remember that and track the program to see how it's doing given those, you know, is this really helping us? Absolutely. It looks like it's proof of the pudding. Yeah, that's a great point on that on that timeline. So General Deptula, six jets are in production, which is great. And you mentioned it. We need a whole lot more. So how many do you think the Air Force should buy and at what rate? Well, let me just reiterate that preparing for the future is the rationale for the B-21. 
Today's small inventory of geriatric bombers pretends way too much risk. Uh, not only is today's bomber force undersized to the power projection forces required by our security strategy, but the numbers are too anemic to backfill realistic combat losses. Now, if the United States finds itself in a war, commanders today will struggle to execute their strategies for want of relevant weapon systems in the numbers required to win. This is going to see servicemen and women put their lives on the line trying to make up the difference. We can avoid that fate, but that requires decisive action now. It demands resetting the strategy resource gap so that ends, ways, and means align. It's been far too long since this has occurred when it comes to American air power. Now, specific to your question, with respect to the B-21, I tell you the focus should be on production rate capability and the production rate today because the final numbers realized be determined well into the future, but a production rate of 15 to 18 per year is necessary to reverse the dangerous decline in our long-range strike capacity, quite frankly, to meet the demands of our national defense strategy. Of all the weapon systems in the U.S. inventory, the B-21 is the most relevant to deterring and, if necessary, defeating what DOD has identified as America's pacing threat, and that's China. Specifically, the B-21's custom-made for dealing with the challenges posed by the China threat. The ability to rapidly conquer the tyranny of distance inherent in the vastness of the Pacific region of the globe and survive. So, it would be prudent to buy as many as we can, as fast as we can, and tooling up to do 15 to 18 per year is what our goal ought to be. Yeah, I'll jump in on that. I agree. The short answer is as fast as possible and for size, we need at least 225 B-21s. Now, just to expand a bit, Congress should fund max production rate for the B-21. Now, my best guess is we might see a production rate that is capped by the Air Force's budget, not by Northrop Grumman's actual production capacity. And that would be a surprise given that the Air Force's budget is billions of dollars less every year than the Army's and Navy's budget, and it's been that way for decades. So if we see a budget-constrained acquisition rate of 8 to 10 B-21s per year, and assuming a gradual production ramp-up will take you know, three or four years, we might not have the bomber force we need until the 2040s, and that's unacceptable, especially since China's military buildup is on pace to support an invasion of Taiwan or another campaign late this decade. So that's why I'm an advocate of maximizing the B-21 production rate. It's critical to achieving the highest priority of our national defense strategy, which is deterring a conflict that would be far more costly than the relatively few dollars saved by a budget cap production rate. Now, as for bomber size, quick word, multiple analyses support growing our bomber force to 300 or more aircraft. Now, that might seem like a huge number to some, but I remember when there were 411 total bombers on the ramp at the end of the Cold War. And that was to deter a single great power adversary, not China and Russia. So I do not think that's an unreasonable number whatsoever. And just to add in, it's time to stop asking what's the cost of doing this and start asking what's the cost of not doing it. Bingo. Yeah, great point, Doug. Great point. All right. We all knew the jet uh, was likely going to be smaller than the B-2, and it is. So, uh, Gonzo, you were directly involved with the decisions early on, you know, on the size and what the airplane needed to look like. So can you walk us through this? I mean, frankly, as a fighter guy, I would just think bigger bombs were better. So, Yeah. So we touched on this a bit last episode, but let's think like a force planner for once. We're all force planners right now. Now, our combatant commanders need a bomber force that can strike thousands of targets and hundreds of hours against the Target sets that could number well over 100,000 aim points. And those aim points dispersed over very large areas like, well, the Western Pacific. And that's thousands of square miles. And it takes a much larger force to do that than today's 141 bombers, which was downsized for operations in relatively constrained battle spaces like Iraq and Iran. So the challenge is to rebuild a larger bomber force while also funding other critical Air Force modernization programs. So from a force planning perspective, that means 
We want to try to strike the right balance between the size of the B-21's inventory, the design features that drive its unit cost, and, of course, the budget is available. It's a sweet spot somewhere in there between the B-21's capabilities, inventory, size, and cost. So the trick is to find that sweet spot. Now, one of the benefits of a family assistance for long-range strike is you can spread out some capabilities like sensors and electronic attack meters across multiple aircraft instead of concentrating them in a single bomber. And that helps create a more resilient strike package, and it creates options to present more complex challenges to the enemy's air defenses. It can also reduce the cost of a new bomber, making it more affordable and a larger buy feasible. So payload capacity for bombers is another strategic design choice. And trading off some payload capacity, which means an aircraft might be a bit smaller and carry fewer weapons per sortie, can also reduce its unit costs. And like range requirements, payload capacity is a major determinant of an aircraft's weight and cost. And since we so largely buy modern fixed-wing aircraft by the pound, you can see the impact that could have. So again, the real point is balancing out inventory size with the cost and the capabilities to meet the demand signal of our combatant commanders. Awesome. So Doug, what's your take from the Hill and the public relations vantage? You know, what's required to keep this program sold so we can get the volume we need? First off, the service and the combatant commands need to be completely transparent with their actual requirement, not what they can afford, but what they actually need to execute the war plan, given things like attrition and realistic demands in play and concurrent operations. I mean, look at the tensions we had in the Pacific this summer with China over Taiwan, and at the same time, Ukraine was kicking off. So it's very feasible to think you're going to need these in in two theaters at, at a given time. That number is very different than what they are currently discussing. The Air Force knows that number, but they don't publicly discuss it. They only talk to what they can afford. That's a huge mistake. And I get it. They're allocated a certain amount of money, and that's it. But that doesn't mean that you can't live in duality. You can say, this is what I can afford, and this is what I need, and what's in between is called risk. Congress, you decide. But we need to be very transparent with that, because when we need these things, there is not going to be time to surge capacity. I I cite Ukraine again. I mean, look how we're struggling with much simpler technologies to to scale them in in production. And so we need to get that number up fast. We also need to, as General Deptul and and Gonza talked about, address this issue of cost. And it really, Mitchell, we talk about cost per effect and, and other concepts in play. But bottom line, what does it cost to achieve these effects another way? And every other pathway is more expensive. And it's not viable. And in some places, it's just straight up impossible. We could never service over 100,000 targets with cruise missiles. Not going to happen. And so they have to be very, very clear about that. And they've got to put people back in their box that are coming out with arguments that, that frankly, are BS. And these are very known arguments that have been going on for decades you know, we can respond to them in our sleep. On, on this side, it, it's time for others to be more aggressive in that realm. And then finally, I would go to this notion of what is the cost of not doing it? And what is the cost of not ramping the rate fast enough? You know, all these things. People always on the Hill are making choices between where they put money. They have to understand if I do not do X, then what is consequence Y? Otherwise, it's like, eh, whatever. Didn't really hurt, I guess. The service never said there was really a downside. We'll get there eventually. You can't do that. You got to put a penalty that people really understand. And all this has to be in very simple terms. Yeah, I totally agree. Just sounds like Air Force leaders need to really fight for what they need. General Deptula and Gonzo, anything to add? I mean, you know, and I want to bring it back because both of you lived through the B-2, which obviously didn't work. And as Doug mentioned, this is clearly a different environment. Yeah, well, what will keep the B-21 support on the Hill is pretty simple, and that's for the program to maintain cost, schedule, and performance. It really is as simple as that. So far, all those elements are exceeding expectations, and that's the path to success to getting the numbers we need in the future. Yeah, I think there's a continuing need to educate the public and the Congress on the facts behind issues such as the cost-effectiveness of penetrating bombers, as Doug 
and they've said. Well, we're still seeing today, some people ask if it'd be cheaper just to buy lots and lots of standoff missiles. We've seen some up hits on that recently, in fact. Now, those arguments are usually made by commentators who have little to no operational experience or even exposure to the hundreds of studies that have looked at that issue. The good news is the facts greatly outweigh uninformed opinions, and that's one of the reasons why there is a, a Mitchell Institute to spread the truth of the matter. Just one more quick point, and that is the notion that B-2s cost $2 billion each. Now, that usually comes from people who add up everything the DoD spent to develop and buy the B-2 and then divide it by 21 aircraft. The point is $2 billion was not the B-2's projected unit cost when the plan was to buy 132 of them. And the number of aircraft you buy is a huge driver of its cost for a number of reasons, including the fact that you must divide the relatively fixed cost of design and develop it across the number you buy. Uh, let me give you a quick example. You could buy a really nice Corvette today for about $80,000, but think what you would have to pay for that car if GM had designed the Corvette, tooled up his factory to produce it, and hired a workforce only to build 21 of them. It's not going to be $80,000. Yeah, yeah, that, that is a great point. What about the nuclear component of the aircraft? You know, we often focus on the conventional strike, but the triad is really important, especially as China and Russia are actively leaning on their nuclear arsenal. So thoughts on how this should impact B-21 capabilities and capacity? Yeah, I think this is a really, really interesting question. Now, we're coming out of a treaty with Russia, and we now have a multipolar deterrence regime here where both China and Russia now have nuclear triads. And China is in a strategic breakout. It's been described by STRATCOM and the DNI and others. And it's building thousands of new weapons, nuclear weapons, to achieve parity with the U.S. or even exceed our, our triad. So we now have to deter multiple actors. And frankly, the nuclear force we now have on the ramp in silos and at sea might not suffice. So we might have to start thinking about how can we rebuild and increase the capacity of our nuclear deterrent. Well, you know, you could build more silos or ICBMs or more uh, SSBNs, those are really, really expensive options. But there's this other option, the air-breathing leg of the triad, nuclear-capable bombers. They're the most cost-effective leg of the triad, and they're dual-capable. So a larger force of B-21s, not just enhance conventional deterrence, but nuclear deterrence as well. It would hedge against the need to deter two nuclear triads. So that is something I think is worth exploration. Well, what I'd tell you, Slick, is just real quickly, the B-21 is the most flexible arm of our nuclear triad, as Gonzo said in so many words. And its nuclear delivery capability is going to go a long way in deterring a growing Chinese nuclear threat, as well as the formidable Russian nuclear threat that already exists. So Bottom line, that in conjunction with its conventional capability really makes it the best investment for the defense dollar spent in DOD today. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, sir. I'm going to speed us up here, do a couple rapid fire questions. So Gonzo, you've written a lot about future munitions requirements. And now that you've seen the jet, what are your thoughts? Got to optimize our munitions inventory for our, our fifth generation and sixth generation fighters and bombers. We don't have the right mixed munitions. They're either skewed towards direct attack or very long range standoff. And that will sub optimize our penetrating strike aircraft. And we have the technology. We just need the resources to build those new weapons that will increase weapons per sortie to maximize effects we can create in the battle space that are going to be so critical to deterring and defeating Chinese aggression. Great. And then, uh, Doug, any chance for foreign sales of the B-21? First off, we don't know if the jet really has that capability. You have to have anti-tamber and things like that. However, the requirement definitely exists. I would argue the UK never recovered from losing the Vulcan. I mean, you think about what it did in the Falklands War and, and what their threats are today. And I think Australia certainly is a contender for it. So I would be a huge fan. And I also think we need to think about sizing the production line for that bolt-on build if it is possible to sell it to 
partners. Yeah, well, I tell you, it is possible, and this could be a game changer for our allied approach to deter potential conflict. Offering the B-21 to the Royal Air Force and the Royal Australian Air Force would definitely strengthen deterrence of Chinese and Russian adventurism. Now, we'll need to be creative about how this is accomplished. Perhaps a leasing arrangement over a period of time with transfer of ownership at some point, but it would be prudent to offer this aircraft to our closest allies. And just to add on to what Doug mentioned, it's also another good reason to prepare for a robust production rate early in the program. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. All right, last question. If you each had a few minutes with Air Force leadership and you could offer advice about the future of the program, what would it be? And we'll get started with General Deptula. Well, Slick, I'll actually have that opportunity tomorrow night when I host Air Force Chief of Staff General C.Q. Brown at our final Mitchell Institute Dinner of the Year. I'll first congratulate him on the performance of the Air Force in managing the B-21 program to date. I'll encourage him to do everything possible to keep up that performance. And then I'll recommend that he advocate for a production rate that rapidly builds B-21 capacity, and that's 15 to 18 per year. What we need not just what the arbitrary budget might restrict the Air Force from buying. You know, I've been a programmer. I get it. The Air Force has to deliver a balanced budget. It's a program objective memorandum every year, but that doesn't abrogate the leadership from advocating for what's actually necessary to meet the needs of the nation's defense strategy. Now, let me uh, jump in. Mrs. Secretary, Chief, first, maximize B-20 production rate. Get them into the field as quickly as possible. Second, develop a field that new generation of mid-range PGMs that will take maximum advantage of the B-21's ability to penetrate and strike a large number of targets for sortie. Third, and this is just as important as the first two, ask Congress for the resources the Air Force needs to maximize B-21's acquisition, as well as fifth-gen fighters, munitions, and other capabilities that are going to determine success or failure in a war with China. Other services are asking, but our Air Force seems to be far more reluctant to admit that its budget is simply too small for its mission today. I'd start up with negotiation 101. It is simple. Don't begin with a negotiated down number that you imposed upon yourself by budget caps. Go with what you need. Otherwise, you're never going to get it. And and they've got to be utterly transparent on that. Yeah, that's a great point, Doug. And I, I just want to say, can't thank you all enough for being here to share the incredible experience that you had. It's just unbelievable to physically be there at the rollout. And obviously, we're looking at the future of air power in so many ways, and it's just incredible. Okay, thanks, Luke. Happy holidays, Slick. Hey, thanks again. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.